It's the 6th of October, and you're listening to Kopi Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist, welcoming you to our 31st episode. Global markets were already quite nervous about the U.S. presidential elections with possibilities of a narrow outcome that could get dragged through the course for weeks, if not months, after the actual date of election. Never before entertained outcomes were already on the drawing board ranging from civil unrest to a constitutional crisis if, for instance, Donald Trump calls the elections from the popular vote illegitimate and resorts to state legislators and courts to force a different outcome. Over the last few days, of course, matters have become even more uncertain. This is because of President Trump's hospitalization after testing positive for COVID-19 and his subsequent release. One wonders how this development would impact the rest of the campaign and its eventual outcome. To go over all this and some more longer-term issues related to Asia, today we will talk to James Crabtree, a distinguished Singapore-based author and journalist and associate professor of practice at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. James's best-selling book, The Billionaire Raj, was shortlisted for the F.D. McKinsey Book of the Year Award. His career has spanned both policy and media, including working at the Financial Times and as an advisor in the UK Prime Minister's Strategy Unit under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. James Crabtree, a very warm welcome to Kopi Time. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Same here. Uh, hey, James, uh, I'd like to break up our discussion in two parts. Uh, first, about the next four to six weeks, largely around U.S. politics. And second, about the next few years uh, with a longer term lens uh, around the region's outlook in the context of post-COVID recovery and great power rivalry, on which issue I know that you, know, you have been writing quite extensively. Uh, on the first... Uh, the near-term stuff. Uh, what's your sense of the drama of the last few days with the U.S. president testing positive for COVID-19, along with several members of his entourage, and as it turns out, a few senators? How do you think these turn of events will influence uh, voter behavior along with the process of voting itself? So I think we all approach this question with huge fear because of what happened in the last election. And, and so nobody really trusts the evidence in front of you because last time people trusted the evidence and it said that Hillary was going to win and she didn't. But all of the evidence suggests that this must be bad for Trump. I mean, he's well behind according to all of the polls. So unless the polls are flat out wrong, which they might be, but there's no reason to think that they are, he needs to do something in this closing period of the race. And it's hard to see how catching COVID even if he then recovers, is positive um, for that. I mean, I think you saw in the last debate that this was the performance of a man who recognized that he simply had to shake things up by roughing up his opponent um, and trying to disrupt what has been happening. Um, but the fact of his illness and the fact that he's now back in the White House as we speak, it's hard to come up with a scenario where that's good for him. And again, if you look at the polls, both after the debate and to the extent we have evidence after his diagnosis, uh, they seem, if anything, to have got slightly more favorable for, for Biden. So the, you know, the current average is 51 and 43. And, you know, that's an excellent position for a challenger to be in. So Nobody wants to be, uh, nobody wants to make any predictions about this, but, but Trump clearly has a, a, a huge road to climb and every day that passes um, is one day less in which he's able to change the conversation or talk about things that are more favorable to him. No, absolutely, James. I think I'm very much on the same page with you. Uh, two things that I've been sort of following uh, where um, the, the polls of 2016 versus 2020 are probably different is that I think in 2016, uh, the polls were missing out less educated voters who tend to vote uh, disproportionately for Trump. I think the pollsters have learned a lot about sampling better uh, over the last four years. So I think that error is largely rectified. And also, I think four years ago, if I recall, you know, there were 10 to 15 percent people who till the day of the election were undecided. And now we see that margin something down to like 3%. So I, like you, uh, still have uh, scars from scars from the 2016 prognostication, but it seems to me that the polls are slightly better representative. We'll see. We'll see in a month's time. Um, James, there are a whole bunch of crucial policy matters are hand even before that uh, election date, which is less than a month from now. And I'd like you to indulge us with those uh, one by one. First, on the Supreme Court nomination of Amy Barrett. Uh, 
So in a sense, Trump has been quite lucky in his run into this election. So if you think about that question of what, what is it that he needed to try and change the conversation, the polls have actually been remarkably stable uh, for a couple of months now. Um, and so first he got a debate about law and order, which followed um, the, the violence in the aftermath of various of, of these police actions. And then he got a Supreme Court nomination. Um, and so both of those things are the kind of things that you're looking for in his position, that if not resetting the campaign, then they can begin to generate some momentum. I, I think in the aftermath of his diagnosis, quite a lot of the positive momentum that he got from the Barrett uh, nomination process has been lost, uh, in particular because it was appears to be an event around the nomination process that has caused so much of the problem. Uh, I mean, the, the remaining question is, can uh, Mitch McConnell and the leadership in the Senate ram this thing through? So the timetable, as I understand it, is that we've got about uh, a week to go until they're going to bring this to the floor and then another week until they have a vote and then they're going to get the whole thing done within about eight days of the election. I think that timetable now has to be in doubt. Um, you've had two or three of the senators who've tested positive for COVID um, and, and simply the, the, the level of anxiety about the medical condition is going to make it difficult to move this forward. It's certainly not impossible that they can do it. And my standing assumption is that, that this is that this was a done deal until until the events of the last few days. But I, I think it's going to be more difficult for them to reach that timetable. And so maybe it will be even closer to the election uh, before they get it done. That's right. Um, again, I mean, you know, opinions are so polarized. So even if it is indeed a uh, unconventional fast track nomination process, I can't really see anybody who was going to vote for Trump being turned off by that and switch sides. And similarly, the energized Democrat voters uh, will be outraged even further, but I really don't see how that would change anything. Looking at Lindsey Graham and others, uh, regardless of few senators having COVID, I think they will probably do a Zoom vote and get it all done. Um, James, there are other issues, uh, including uh, the risk of politicization of the vaccine approval process. I think we're not going to put it past Trump to come up with a grand announcement in the next few weeks that some vaccine has been approved. Now, how would that reflect on the race and also acceptance of uh, such a vaccine? I think it's quite likely that this is going to happen. You can see the maneuverings uh, over the last week or two uh, there has been a White House rejection of various bits of uh, FDA approval processes, um, and you can see that Trump is agitating uh, for this to happen. Um, whether it would make a big difference, I'm not entirely sure. One of the big problems that he had, again, if you look at the polls, is in addition to losing you know, women, moderates, and independents, the most recent poll shows some pretty catastrophic numbers with old people. Um, and so I suppose part of the calculation is that, that American seniors are going to um, be particularly relieved uh, if, a, if a vaccine is announced. And so I suppose if he does announce one, then it'll probably be reasonably good for him. But as you say, the question is, are there going to be huge amounts of swing or undecided voters to whom this is the reason that they decide to go back to Trump? And given the fact that an announcement like this will come with a huge storm of protest and get uh, um, wound up in the, the normal kind of partisan bickering because you can be sure that this will be an announcement that will have been fiddled in, in one way or another given the, the fact that the, the scientists and the, the vaccine companies uh, have said that they don't think it's possible to have a vaccine announcement before election day. Uh, whether or not this will be any kind of political game changer, I'm rather doubtful. That's right. I mean, to me, you know, these vaccine approval processes ought to be done by scientists and medical professionals. But as far as the public is concerned, I mean, there are two critical dimensions. One is the effectiveness. Again, that is something that the scientists would have to make a call on. But then there's the issue of the safety, which is the product of painstaking, laborious uh, trials. And fast-tracking them, I don't know. I mean, effectiveness, maybe you can convince people. But the safety part, there's a reason why we take years to develop vaccines. Uh, and, and, and already, and particularly the U.S., is such a skeptical society as far as vaccine is concerned. I don't think the phrase anti-vaxxer exists anywhere else in the world except for the U.S. Um, so the uh, politicization of this uh, just gets a, you know, a fairly challenging issue, even more challenging. James, uh, I've been reading essays from political scientists and observers in the Atlantic and foreign affairs and elsewhere where the fear is that 
the election is not going to get decided on the evening of November the 3rd in the U.S. It will drag on, um, if not for weeks, if not for months, but at least for weeks. Um, what's your sense of the strength of U.S. institutions? Can they withstand these unprecedented developments and ensure a peaceful and orderly election as well as transition of power? I think an awful lot depends on the nature of the result. In fact, everything depends on the nature of the result. So it, it, it's not at all implausible that if there's a very close result, particularly given the way that Trump has been systematically undermining the process, that there would be legal challenges either in particular states or nationally. I mean, indeed, you only have to go back to um, Bush, Bush Gore to, to see what this might look like, where, uh, you know, then there were, were many weeks um, in which the, the result was being litigated before, uh, before Gore gave up. So I, I think if it's a close result, then that is absolutely certain to happen or, or sort of all but certain to happen. And the question then becomes, you know, at, at what level does Biden have to win uh, in order to avoid that eventuality? Uh, of of uh, a a kind of plausible legal challenge that could delay um, or that could leave both sides plausibly claiming victory, um, or in a sense one in which Biden could plausibly claim victory, but but Trump and his supporters could cook up, cook up some kind of conspiracy theory. And I suspect that investors in particular are underplaying the likelihood of this happening. I mean, it does unfortunately seem to me quite likely that there will be. Um, a post-election legal battle of one form or another. And it seems to me undeniable that although US political institutions are strong compared to most countries in the world, that they're weaker than they were given the nature of the political environment during the Trump presidency. And so I'm, I think it, people are very ri are right to be worried about this and a close result on election day, let alone something like a, a statistical tie, which is not impossible to imagine. There are scenarios in which you could have the two candidates tied on 270 each. Um, you know, th this is, um, uh, you know, could be very difficult. No, I mean, there, there are all sorts of troubling scenarios out there. One, of course, is, you know, the, the whole process of counting absentee ballots, which will, of course, turn up in very large numbers and unprecedented numbers this time. And then the deadline that you respect and under which criteria do you accept or reject those absentee ballots. So all sorts of fights can break out in those narrow swing states. Of course, the state that created all that drama 20 years ago, Florida may well be again um, in, the, in the thick of action this time. Uh, so yeah, it will not be a dull moment, uh, but a month from now uh, we'll get a better sense. But till then, I guess, you know, we'll stand by. Uh, James, um, we can spend the whole podcast talking about short term, but I think as you rightly explained to me a couple of days ago when we talked about this, that, you know, things might become pretty stale by the time this podcast gets done, how, given how dynamic things are. So let's talk about stuff that will probably have more shelf life. Uh, so move on from the near-term noise of U.S. election. Let's put that aside and talk about the fact that, you know, we've had a few years of trade and tech war with the U.S. pushing back China. And through the course of this year, we've seen a broadening of U.S.-China antagonism, including on regional security and human rights. So let's consider both scenarios, a Trump term two and a Biden administration, how will these dynamics play out in each of those scenarios? Well, I, I think if Trump returns, then I, I think that the, the tendency is to say, well, you'll see more of the same, but I think you'll see more of more of the same to, to coin a phrase. So I, I think Trump is going to continue to paint China as the, the, the main economic enemy of the United States. But I think what you're likely to see uh, is much more focus on forcing American companies to leave China and to some extent to leave Asia as well, um, both because of security concerns about China, but also because of nationalist concerns, economic nationalist concerns about outsourcing. So far, you've seen Trump exhorting American businesses to leave this part of the world, but you haven't actually seen him put the screws on them uh, in, a, in a serious sense. And I think that's much more likely to come in a second term um, agenda. From the Biden point of view, I, I think you will see more continuity than perhaps many people uh, or many of his supporters would hope. I think politically, it's not plausible to imagine Biden 
coming up with some kind of entente with China that would, uh, in a sense, take things back to where they were four or five years ago. The political debate in the US has changed substantially. Biden's views himself seems to have changed substantially. But I think you'd see a change in, in both language and approach. So that the language of, of decoupling, I think, would probably be quietly shelved. And it, you, you'd hear them talking much more about economic resilience and domestic competitiveness. And I think you would see a, a return to a, a kind of traditional multilateralism um, in which Biden spent more time time trying to, to work out with allies in the region, how do you deal with a, with a rising China? So, um, so I think you, you'd see less of a change perhaps than Biden's supporters would wish, but it would be different from the policy that Trump would have followed. Uh, yeah, James, I fully agree with you that the dialogue has shifted fundamentally and there's no going back to where, how things were. Um, in fact, when I look at the manifesto from the Biden camp, they also have explicit incentives for quote unquote, building in America. So incentives for onshoring and disincentives for offshoring. So uh, those carrots and sticks would probably be there on both sides. But I also think that, you know, it's safe to say that it'll be a little more rules based and a little less volatile. But one thing that was very big five years ago, James, was a Trans-Pacific Partnership, which, you know, Trump made sure as, you know, because it was done under the aegis of Obama's administration, he had to ditch it. Do you see that getting re-energized under a Biden term? I, I think he said specifically that he won't sign any trade agreements until uh, until the kind of economic recovery at home is underway. So I think people in this part of the world who think the US is going to waltz back into TPP are living in a fantasy land, really. I, I can imagine a scenario in some distant time, you know, sort of sometime the next decade where the US could come back into this agreement, particularly if it had a second stage that was enlarged to include other countries around the Pacific and potentially even my own country of the United Kingdom. And at that point, you can make a, a, a kind of much more plausible case that the original agreement that, that was rejected um, has now changed substantially and the US can come back in. Uh, but I think in a sense, what Biden has to play with is not so much joining TPP, it's what does he do with the tariffs? So uh, he has the tariffs that Trump has set, and he has a question as to, are you going to reduce them? And if so, what are you going to ask in exchange for that? So what is going to be your agenda that you try and use to, to de uh, de-tariffies uh, the relationship between the, the US and China. And I think that that we're not really clear on at the moment. It's not quite clear exactly how Biden is going to try and play this hand um, if he is going to have a more predictable and slightly less tariff-focused approach to China. But on the technology side, I, I really don't think there's going to be a huge amount of difference between the way that the Trump administration and the Biden administration would play. I think at the edges, you could say that maybe he would be less erratic in the way he begins to use some of these tools like the entity list or the way that Trump went after TikTok. But I would have imagined that under a Biden administration, some sort of process would have begun that would have targeted a company like TikTok and that, that this will continue, that there will continue to be heightened national security suspicion of Chinese companies and a gradual bifurcation of the world and Asia in particular into companies and zones that either have to deal predominantly with the United States or with China, and that it's going to be much more difficult for companies in Asia and countries in Asia as well to act as kind of honest brokers who are well plugged into both sides of this equation. Yeah, I mean, that has so many um, dimensions that, you know, one needs to be cognizant of. And the first point that you make that on tariffs you know, through history, we've seen it's pretty easy to raise tariffs, especially in the case of the U.S., where it's basically an executive order. It's very challenging to bring them down. I recently came across this notion of these chicken tariffs when the chicken lobby in the U.S. or the poultry lobby in the U.S. Uh, wanted access to Europe. This was way back in the 60s. And the Europeans were being tough. And the Americans put on tariff on cognac and trucks. Uh, 50 years later, those tariffs are still in place. Nobody has managed to bring them down. So yeah, on, on tariff, I think Biden will struggle. Um, if you think about it, you know, Trump uh, behind some podcast desk or Fox News would be screaming every day that he's being soft on China by taking those tariffs down without getting anything in return. So the quid pro quo would become a big deal. Uh, James, but uh, okay, I, I take your point that TPP, there is very little chance of the U.S. coming back on the table anytime soon. But what about the other 
even bigger multilateral framework with the WTO, um, would the U.S. play a little more constructive role than the Trump administration in re-energizing it? Yes, I imagine that it would. Um, I mean, it depends who the, the new Secretary General is going to be. Um, but I think the U.S. would take a much more constructive uh, approach to, to the WTO. Nonetheless, the, the critique of the institution that has taken hold during the Trump administration is now a reasonably bipartisan um, critique. So I, I don't think you would see the WTO returning to its glory days under Pascal Lamy or whoever you might look to, to for the, the kind of high, high watermark. I think that the organization is in crisis in part because the US has taken against it and, and blocked certain internal procedures, but it's also in crisis because of the nature of the global trading system has fundamentally changed from the one that the, the, the glory years of the WTO presided over. And so I think it's very difficult to imagine a situation, given the relationship between the big powers um, here in Asia and around the world, in which the WTO suddenly began to, to take this more um, a sort of catalytic effect in creating trade agreements, given the WTO has had a reasonably minimal role in most of the important trade agreements that have been signed, or if it suddenly was able to return to its role as, a, as an arbitrator and litigator uh, of disputes in the way that perhaps it was five or 10 years ago. So I think the, the, the moment of deep crisis for the WTO might, might pass uh, with under a more constructive Biden administration, but in a sense, the existential malaise at the heart of the institution isn't going to go away. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, you know, understand that whether it is dispute resolution mechanism or the way intellectual property is treated or the biggest dynamic of trade, trade and services in the world, WTO has significant room for reform. But James, wouldn't you say that the Europeans and the Chinese remain cheerleaders of the WTO and therefore it doesn't take that much of sort of pivot from the U.S. to get the ball rolling again? I suppose you could make that argument, but it seems to me that the, the likelihood of Europe and China coming up, up with a constructive reform agenda um, in the absence of the US or in, in the face of US obstruction seems pretty unlikely. I mean, relations between the EU and China are on a, in any case, on a downward trajectory. I mean, it's been pretty clear that you've seen a a hardening of views in, in Brussels and importantly in Berlin uh, on the relationship with China over the last six to nine months. And so whether it's on climate change or on trade, I think the idea that whether Trump or Biden wins, that there's going to be a, a kind of constructive EU-China agenda on the areas where they, they have common cores, um, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I don't see too much evidence um, that that they can work together to to do something like resuscitate the WTO on on their own. Yeah, I guess to your point, it's not like EU China relationship is particularly rosy either. I think China has also had its share of missteps vis a vis Europe, not just the US in recent years. So I, I take your point that you know sort of a, uh, putting the US in a corner and building an alliance with Europe uh, probably sounded much more plausible a few years ago than today. Uh, there is not that much love lost between particularly the Germans and the Chinese. Um, James, you alluded to the issue of tech, uh, where you don't really see much of a difference between term two of Trump and uh, Biden. So let's talk about that, because that clearly is here to stay with us. Recently, you wrote a detailed and very insightful article on the TikTok saga. Um, what should we take away from this affair? I mean, what does this tell us about the broader U.S.-China relationship? And I think it's been a fascinating example of the way that the world is moving. So uh, if you were to have asked a year ago, was TikTok a national security threat to the United States? I don't think anyone would have taken the question remotely seriously. The idea that a, um, a short form web app whose audience was predominantly teenagers doing zany dance routines um, and magic tricks, uh, the, the notion that this would become a kind of focus of very serious anxiety in Washington, I think people would have not taken that very seriously, but it gives you a sense of how fast things have moved over the last year, that this is now almost a, a, another part of the consensus that although it's a little bit hard to put your finger on exactly what the nature of that 
security threat is that there are theoretical things that might happen with data from TikTok users or potential political interference, Russian style meddling, using TikTok as a platform, a platform which is used by something like 100 million Americans. Um, and so I think it, it gives you a sense of the, the lack of trust and the low barrier now to the low and decreasing barriers to claims of national security threats when it comes to anything to do with the US-China technology relationship. And so if TikTok can be seen as a threat to national security, I think my basic conclusion is so can everything else. And so I would expect any other Chinese company that wanted to do anything inside the United States, be it a cloud computing provider or a mobile phone handset manufacturer uh, or, or really any other kind of company to come under this sort of scrutiny. But I think there's a wider lesson from this here in Asia, which is much um, regardless of your view on the US-China uh, conflict which is the lesson that other countries are going to take out of this. So the deal that Trump uh, has forged, which is by no means stable, it might all collapse in a heap. It's hard to see what's going to happen. That This strange deal with uh, Oracle as a minority or potentially majority shareholder um, working with ByteDance, the Chinese company, um, it's a rather uh, unfortunate compromise that, that smells of, if not corruption, then then process that was poorly followed um, and favoritism for, um, in Larry Ellison, the Oracle founder, a Republican and a Trump donor. But the most important thing, I think, is that other countries around the world are going to look at this and say, well, if the Americans are going to behave in this way, if they're going to effectively nationalize uh, part of a Chinese company simply because they don't like China, then we will behave in exactly the same way. And so you saw within days of this deal being announced, calls in India for India to nationalize Facebook India or nationalize Google in India, or at least to force these American companies to go into ungainly partnerships with Indian tech companies. And so I think that that kind of uh, long-term effect may be the most significant part of this, that as the US retreats from its traditional role as the guardian of a, of a free and open global internet of a sort, um, that in a sense was how the US saw itself from a regulatory point of view over much of the last 10 years, and instead comes up with these much more security-focused um, nationalistic uh, exceptions of which TikTok is a great example, and lots of other countries are going to do that as well. And that's why people begin to talk about a, a splinter net or a, a kind of world of technology and digital commerce, uh, which is much more divided by different kinds of national protectionism than we have seen over the last couple of decades. It's a terribly slippery slope, uh, James, because you can start with the argument that, you know, I don't want sensitive data of Americans on their personal preferences and beliefs uh, captured through social media. But personal data is embedded in every single transaction or exchange we carry out on the internet, uh, from e-commerce to uh, our reading behavior, as well as you know the, the dance videos on TikTok that you're talking about. Um, and, and that would uh, create not just, you know, couple of Chinese companies here and they're going in trouble and, and and it will not only be restricted to the big tech issues like Facebook and so on, it could be everywhere. Uh, and you could see unscrupulous uh, states persons and governments taking full advantage of that to stifle speech and um, exchange of ideas. So I, I fear that uh, whether it was fully intentional or inadvertent, the Trump administration has opened up uh, Pandora's box and um, this TikTok saga, as you correctly say, a year ago would not have been in anybody's radar. Sounds quite ridiculous, and I am glad that you brought up the, the, the corruption angle as well. Looks unsavory, but may well be a very big canary in a coal mine uh, going forward. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I agree with all of that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think if you're sitting in Silicon Valley at the moment um, and you are, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or you're Sundar Pichai and you look at this, on the one hand, you might think, well, this is great. The US government just came along and took out one of our most plausible competitors. But I'm pretty sure that in their more clear-eyed moments, they realize that this is bad for, for uh, American big tech um, at a moment in which American big tech is already coming under a lot of scrutiny for, for other reasons. And that in a sense, one of the things that will die along with TikTok is the dream that almost anybody can become a truly global uh, internet company of the, the sort that 
the Silicon Valley mavens would have would have dreamt about 10 years ago. Clearly, Chinese companies can't become global. They're not going to be allowed to go into the US or many of the US's allies because of national security considerations. Western companies aren't going to be allowed to go into China, but I think you're just going to see a spreading of these kind of exceptions where, where countries like India in particular, which until this point have been reasonably open to uh, international um, technology, are going to become more defensive, more concerned with building up their own tech national champions. And I don't think this is going to change whoever wins the US election. I, I, I think it's hard to see uh, a President Biden executing a change of policy which will be sufficient to stop the dynamic that Trump and, and other things not to do with Trump have put in play uh, in this regard. Yeah, right. Look, when the world was all about trade and goods, I could argue that in a furniture has no national security uh, angle. But today, uh, if it is about national security and data privacy and just about everything that we do has an E element to it, uh, the the, uh, net can be very, very wide. James, uh, I have been following your writing since you were the Mumbai uh, Bureau Chief of FT. You've been living in Singapore for a few years now. You spent a lot of time writing for Nikkei, and you're an astute observer of Asia. So the final part of our discussion that I want to have is getting us your report card on Asian economies. A number of Asian economies have done a pretty decent job in dealing with the pandemic and reviving their economies, and a few, which I would like you to highlight, have not. Uh, you know, so for the ones who have done well, is this a huge plus that, you know, you're resilient in a once in a century pandemic? And for the ones who are not doing so well, uh, does it say something deeper and broader and more troubling for them? So I'd let you take away with that one. I suppose you'd rather be doing better than doing worse, wouldn't you? You'd rather be in China's position than India's. Uh, I mean, I think the the you know, th- this is a once in a generation shock, uh, maybe longer than that, given the, the size of it. I mean, it's a really unprecedented, the, the, the kind of data that we've seen. I, I think you're going to see a much greater division between South Asia on the one hand and Southeast and particularly East Asia uh, on the other. So it's you know, the South Asian economies are the ones that have done particularly badly. And so whether that's simply the rate of growth that we can expect out of countries like India or Pakistan, um, or the, the development indicators that you're going to see in terms of poverty reduction, um, urbanization, all sorts of measures are going to be damaged by this. So that the kind of reform and growth agenda that many people who look at, at countries in South Asia or poorer bits of Southeast Asia is going to be damaged by this. Um, and by contrast, the, the you know richer more industrial economies that have the ability to borrow heavily for stimulus programs and have done reasonably well in controlling the pandemic I mean, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, here with us in Singapore. I mean, nobody wants to be in the position that they're in, but they're obviously doing relatively better. And so I think one of the consequences of this is going to be a much deeper division between the, the bits of emerging Asia that we we thought might be the next drivers of global growth, the the Indian rim joining India and Africa together, as opposed to the Pacific rim. Um, The idea that that is going to become the next fast growing region of the world that investors can look to, um, I think looks much less likely in the short to medium term after uh, after the pandemic, and indeed much more likely that you're going to see a, in South Asia something approaching a, a lost decade um, of reform potential. So, so that that I think is the the big picture where you know n- nobody's doing very nobody's doing excellently out of this, but it's South Asia that's the real loser. Yeah, indeed. You know, James, my fear is that a year from now uh, the industrialized world will have. Uh, begun the process of rolling out vaccine, all their travel lanes will be restored, but there will still be considerable amount of uh, mistrust with South Asians and other developing country travelers. So a lot of them still would not be traveling for tourism purposes or education purposes. And again, that goes into your narrative of this lost decade because students who will not be able to go abroad for higher studies would again sort of miss out uh, not years, if not decades uh, of, of earning potential and enhancement of their human capital. So it is a very worrisome time. But within East Asia, which I, I concur with you that by and large, you know, infection numbers have flattened out and there is wherewithal. But a um, couple of countries, particularly Indonesia and Philippines, are more akin to India than the rest of East Asia, where 
sort of infection rates are still going up uh, and you do have various challenges of governance. Um, so do you not worry that these countries will also run into resource constraint and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, constraints uh, beyond just resource constraint going forward? Yeah, so I suppose you're, you're right to pick up on this. When I was thinking of Southeast Asia, I was thinking more of the Mekong states, which have done so well um, for reasons that remain to some degree mysterious, the, the middle-income Mekong states. So Indonesia in particular uh, bears many similarities with India. I know less about the Philippines as a, as a case study, but um, so I think within Southeast Asia, you see a, a distribution, both a distribution in terms of the impact that COVID has had, but also a distribution of the ability of states to respond. So and within that, you have some quite curious examples like Myanmar, which clearly has very limited public finances in a weak state, but actually has until the last couple of weeks a, a, a pretty admirable um, COVID record. Um, but yes, uh, countries like Indonesia, I think, are, are more in the Indian Indian bucket, um, where they will struggle to bring the disease under control, um, and, and you're looking at quite a long pathway. You know, we we don't know when a vaccine is going to be available, um, but let's imagine it's something like the the first couple of quarters of next year that you begin to have uh, people getting their hands on this. Then it win very large countries that need. Uh, double dose for populations of hundreds of millions, then uh, it's simply going to take a very long time. Um, you know, you're, you're talking not next year, but the year after until you can plausibly imagine um, a, a mass vaccination process. And so already in Asia, one of the things that's marked out this region is as opposed to Europe or North America, you've seen extreme institutional conservatism, potentially wise conservatism, but conservatism nonetheless, on reopening rules and so I think, um, you, you know, that, that will continue, that, that within the green zones, the, the rich countries that have done reasonably well, they will continue to be conservative. But then that presents another problem, which is that eventually there's a, you, you, there's a kind of hanging question about whether you can keep your borders closed forever and bear the economic cost that this brings. And therefore, although you would rather be in the position of having a very good record and an awkward conversation about whether or not you ought to reopen, even if that raises the risk of some level of COVID infection. Um, nonetheless, this is this is a challenge that some of the richer countries in in Asia have. So, if you're if you're Taiwan or South Korea or Japan or Singapore or even China, then given what looks like a long pathway to uh, mass vaccination, you also have to begin to trade off the ongoing economic cost of keeping your borders closed or keeping your borders mostly closed um, with your you know, pretty good COVID uh, uh, suppression records. And, and so that I think is, is something to watch as to how the countries are going to try and manage that. I put Australia and New Zealand in that bracket as well. Um, in a sense, there's, these are the kind of conundrums of those countries that have done well, um, as opposed to the conundrums like Indonesia or India of those countries that have done badly. Absolutely. But James, my other worry is that even if you were to open your economy up for whatever motivation, would people come if the rest of the world is not convinced about your you know, capacity to handle a resurgence of the disease? Uh, James, I was a little tickled uh, when you were saying earlier that for reasons that are not fully understandable, the success of some of the countries in the Mekong Delta, uh, let's go a little north to China. And I, I guess this is the last question that I have for you. China, on one hand, has had a torrid time. The, the confrontation with the U.S., picking fights with India, all sorts of things happening in the Southeast, South China Sea, issues related to Hong Kong and Taiwan and Vietnam, uh, Uyghur Muslims and so on. But on the other hand, this has been a year of tremendous resilience, despite all those distractions and being the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in January, February. China probably has done better than just about anybody else in terms of the whole lives versus livelihood. Very few people on a relative basis have died in China, and livelihood is more or less restored. Our model suggests growth could be as high as 6% in the fourth quarter. So uh, when you say that you know, you're know you a bit mystified by the success of the Mekong Delta countries, are you also mystified by China, or you have a broader set of explanations for their track record this year? No, when I was talking about the Mekong countries, I was talking about a country like Myanmar in particular, right. which has all of the same indicators as India, a weak state, poor economy, um, government that is often 
uh, struggles to to function. Um, also, you know, reasonable amount of inward and outbound visitors, and yet has had very low levels. I think the Chinese case is much more explicable. I mean, there you have a very highly functioning state apparatus. Um, and although people ask questions about the very early stages of the outbreak, um, since then, the ability of the Chinese state to roll out mass testing, a functional test and trace program, um, and its ability to uh, operate regional lockdowns um, uh, involving you know, tens, twenties, and millions of people when they have had small upsurges and to keep those under control and bring them rapidly back uh, to, to suppressed again. I mean, that's been, it's been very impressive. So yes, you have over, we're now in the Chinese holiday week and you're going to have some half a billion people moving around the country with almost no restrictions whatsoever. So it's a remarkable success story and one which we, with which many in other countries I mean, may not be able to replicate it because of the nature of the Chinese state and the way that it works, but there's clearly a lot of learning to be done in terms of how China has managed this so successfully. Um, and I think you're right. Nobody wants to be in the situation. Nobody's in a better position than they were a year ago. But relatively speaking, China has clearly come out of this um, with more regional uh, admiration, uh, particularly here in Southeast Asia, and simply the, the reality of the fact that China's economy is going to be performing at a time when almost nobody else's is. It will give China you know, a huge amount of um, economic and political capital to to develop. So whether that means Xi Jinping is sleeping easily at night is harder to say. I mean, even if China is pulling out annual growth figures of three or four percent, if we'd have been talking about that 18 months ago, we'd have said, well, this is a catastrophe that the Communist Party regime may not survive. Um, so whether or not the, the government there feels uh, reassured or, or, or feels sanguine about its own political prospects is very hard to say, but certainly relative to everyone else, uh, China is doing very well and I suspect will continue absent some other um, quick outbreak that they can't bring under control, will we'll continue to do so and will be a focus for everybody else's reopening as well. In a sense, if you're if you're Singapore, if you're South Korea, even if you're Japan, then an awful lot of your own economic recovery uh, depends upon uh, Chinese tourists, Chinese investment, sort of rekindling and enhancing economic links to China. And so it, China will emerge from this as a more important pole in the wider Asian economy and more important to its trading partners even than it was before. Absolutely. Absolutely. On that very insightful note, uh, thank you, James. Thanks for coming on Copy Time. Thanks so much for having me. I'm sorry we didn't actually get to have some, some actual Copy. We, we should have done that, but uh, there we are. Next time we're at a Hawker Center, maybe we can do that. So uh, Guaranteed. Uh, thank you, James, and thanks to our listeners as well. Uh, Copy Time was produced by Martin Taki. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 31 episodes of Copy Time are now available on YouTube and all major plat podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling EBS Research Library. Have a great day. <laughs>